Hello, today I want to talk about how to beamform with thousands of inexpensive antennas. The goal for our project is simple. We want to increase signal strength. And this could be in cell networks, Wi-Fi, or IoT sensor networks. Let's look at what happens when a transmitter wants to transmit to a receiver. It sends out a signal, which is denoted in blue here, that spreads out in all directions. And because the signal spreads in all directions, it, only a small fraction of it actually reaches the receiver. This is the case where the transmitter has one antenna. If it had more antennas, for instance, nine antennas, it could do beam forming so that the signal here in blue goes toward the receiver more directionally. And this is part of the reason why many Wi-Fi APs have now started sporting so many antennas. Now, let's try and see what happens when we increase the number of antennas to 25, 100, and the beamforming just keeps getting better and better. Something interesting happens when you go from 100 to 1,000, where previously we were just beamforming toward the receiver, now we are actually focusing energy at the receiver. And the trend continues with 3,000 antennas. When we put these pictures side by side, we see that the bigger the array, the more precise the beam. And this is a fundamental physical limit which means that we cannot just be cleverer and beamform better. And the physical limit says that the beamforming ability is a function of the number of wavelengths that the device spans. Now, unfortunately, the wavelength of radio is pretty large relative to our devices, and even fancy APs only span a couple of wavelengths. The same holds for IoT devices and mobile devices, and this puts all of them firmly in the regime where there are less than 10 antennas, because the antennas cannot be too close to each other. So we can't fit more antennas in our transmitters or our receivers, but we can fit more antennas in our environment, because it's big. And this is the key insight behind our paper. For instance, in indoor environments, we have the walls, ceilings, and carpets. And if we stuff all of these surfaces with antennas, then we can actually get a very precise control over our signal without increasing the size of our transmitters or our receivers. So we present our focus, which is an inexpensive wallpaper full of antennas. This is a picture of our prototype. This prototype has 3,200 antennas. Each antenna is very simple. It can either be on, in which case it reflects the signal that is incident on it, or it can be off, in which case it is transparent. These antennas are very simple and passive. They do not emit any power of their own. They just control how they reflect energy. That's what makes them inexpensive. And the controller, for instance, can set a state on this surface, as shown here. To our knowledge, this configuration of 3,200 antennas is the largest number of antennas ever used for a single communication link. To understand how this helps, let's look at a simulation. Here's the transmitter there. And it is transmitting a pulse that gets reflected off of a wall. So far, this behaves as expected, like ripples in a pond. Now, if we put holes in strategic locations in the wall, we can actually make the signal focus at any point that we want. And this is because we have eliminated destructive interference due to the places in the holes where you put the holes. And the same holds in the other direction, where now it's acting as a lens that focuses on the target, where earlier it was acting as a mirror. The system architecture for R focus is as follows. There's a transmitter transmitting to a receiver, and the R focus surface contributes to some parts, along with anything else that's in the environment. And this surface is controlled by a controller, which during the training period configures test states onto the surface. The receiver periodically sends channel measurements to this controller, and the controller uses these channel measurements to optimize the a state that maximizes the signal between the transmitter and the receiver. So for instance, in the simulations we saw before, it will just focus the energy from the transmitter and put it onto the receiver. So how does the controller do that? So let's study a reflection from a normal wall. Here's a transmitter that is transmitting to a receiver. And the strongest path in this case happens to be HC, which is the direct path. We can denote plot HC on the complex plane as shown. The length of HZ denotes the strength of the signal, and the angle denotes the phase. So each of these little pieces in the wall also makes its own contribution. So for instance, the bottommost piece has a contribution from the path with the trans from the transmitter to the bottommost piece to the receiver. And that nudges the channel in the direction shown in H1 in the complex plane. Each of these other elements also makes their own little contribution, 
And the net channel between the transmitter and the receiver is the sum of all of these contributions. Now, you may note that the lines that I've drawn do not follow the usual laws of reflection. Because each of these little pieces of the wall is actually too small and therefore only scatters the signal. It does not reflect in the usual angle of incidence equals angle of reflection law that we are familiar with that emerges as a collective property of all of these little pieces. OK, so how do we take advantage of this? What our focus allows us to do is that it allows us to make some of these elements transparent. In fact, these elements in the wall are antennas in our focus. So to take advantage of this fact, we first note that the red elements are reducing the signal strength. And our focus allows us to turn them off and get rid of those destructive interference. And therefore, the signal strength increases. So we've increased signal strength here by simply getting rid of all the parts of the wall that are interfering destructively with the signal. This obviously raises the question, what characterizes the antennas that, are in, that cause a destructive interference? So to answer that, we'll translate the arrows so that they start at the end of 8z. And we'll draw a dotted line perpendicular to 8c. I claim that everything on, one, on this side of the dotted wall, we should turn it on. Everything on the other side, we turn it off. And this makes intuitive sense. Everything that is aligned with 8z will nudge it to be greater, and everything else will nudge it to be smaller. The rule is that if hi makes an acute angle with 8z, we should turn it on. And we prove in the paper that this is near optimal with high probability if all the hi are small and have randomly distributed phases. This immediately suggests a Strawman algorithm. If we know HZ and HI, we can simply figure out which of the HI are aligned with HZ, and we can figure out which elements to turn on. So the naive method, which some prior work also uses, proceeds as follows. We start off by turning off all the antennas in the wall and looking at the measurements reported by the receiver. This is HZ, by definition. Then we turn on just the ith antenna and look at the measurement, which will now be HZ plus HI. And now we measure the difference, hi. And the challenge is the hi here is tiny. It's a reflection due to a small piece of metal somewhere in the environment. And in our experiments, hi is a million times smaller than the direct signal strength. And there is some prior work in this topic which tries to measure hi directly. And this prior work is small scale in terms of the distances involved and the number of antennas used. And this method does not scale to larger distances because the HI will become smaller and we'll have to do thousands of measurements per antenna to, actually be, to be able to actually measure it. Our focus is the first large scale prototype that demonstrates the feasibility of a system. Such systems have been analyzed theoretically extensively in the EE community. Last year, a paper was published with a similar idea, but the setup is different from ours. They focus on a transmitter and a receiver which are blocked, whose direct path is blocked off by a wall. And to aid this blocking, what they do is they put antennas on either side of the wall connected by wires going through holes in the wall. And uh, these wires take signal from one side to the other, and the antennas have little phase shifters that allow it to beam form onto the receiver. Now, because the elements are more powerful in this case, they need fewer antennas to have, the, have a significant impact on the channel, but this only works for endpoints blocked by this wall. It doesn't work if the endpoint is blocked by another wall or they're both on the same side of the wall. So it's a different system than ours. And since the direct path is blocked, the pass, the, but the path through the elements are not, it is easy to measure HI because it is large relative to HC. So what are the key, we use two key ideas to measure HI. First, instead of measuring the effect of just one antenna, we turn on a random subset of antennas and measure that effect instead. This effect is n times bigger, where n is the number of antennas in the system. And second, we, the effect is still small. And measuring small changes in phase is very hard. And therefore, we rely only on signal strength. So here's another straw man based on the idea of boosting. Again, we are in the regime where we say if we can measure HZ and HI, we know which elements to turn on. So we first start by measuring HZ. Then we turn on a random subset of elements. So BI is one if that element is on. And we measure that channel. And then this gives us a set of linear equations that we can solve. 
Now, the challenge here is even though it is bigger than just hi, delta h is still small. And in particular, the phase is small. The phase is denoted by the angle between the arrows. And the phase grows smaller, as shown in this animation, when ag grows bigger. Um, we are, so therefore, measuring phase is hard. And we, we avoid this problem entirely by just using signal strength. Signal strength has two advantages. First, the change in the signal strength does not decrease with increasing hi, and sec increasing hz. And second, signal strength is easier to measure because amplifiers are just more stable over time <coughs> than clocks. So how do we take measurements? We have antennas 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this, this is a random state of the antenna. So 0 means the antenna is off, 1 means the antenna is on, and the receiver reports a signal strength of 0.8. We do the same thing for multiple random states. This, again, suggests a third Strauman algorithm, where we say that we'll just pick among the random states that we measured, we'll just pick the best random state. Unfortunately, this is very far from optimal. Most random states do not change the channel by more than 1%, whereas the optimal state that we find is 10 times bigger. To find this optimal state, we use a majority voting algorithm. It starts by first identifying the median uh, signal strength measurement, which in this case happens to be 1, because I just typed in the numbers. And then we look at the states which give a better signal strength. So intuitively, we were doing something right in those states, and we should con continue to do the same things. For the other states where we got less than the median, we were doing something wrong there. So we should flip whatever it is that we were doing. This is just in the algorithm and not in the physical world. And now we take a majority vote along the column. So in the first column, we have three rows that vote 1. So we set the antenna to 1. In the second column, we have three votes that vote 0. So we set it to 0. And similarly for all the other antennas. This is our optimized state. And we show in the paper that this is actually also close to optimal. Why is that? Well, remember the earlier slide where we said that we want to turn on all the elements which make an acute angle with HC. So if you look at the distribution of the channel for random states, then it looks a bit like this, where the blob, the randomness, is both from the fact that we are turning on a random subset of antennas and from any noise in the channel. And the effect, and if you look at now only those subset of measurements where the hi ith element happened to be on, because we chose it to be on, then the blob shifts a little bit. And it shifts in the direction of hi. I'm being slightly imprecise here for clarity. I'll refer you to the paper for the exact proof. But what this does is follows. Now, these measurements are slightly more likely to be greater than the median. And therefore, they're slightly more likely to receive votes towards 1. And therefore, they're very likely that our algorithm will turn it on. And it's, as the number of measurements goes to infinity, it will definitely turn it on. The converse holds if hi were not aligned with hz and we're pointing in the opposite direction. So this analysis shows that as the number of measurements goes to infinity, uh, the, it finds the right state. What happens in practice? So here we have plotted the training time in the x-axis on the bottom and the number of measurements used in the x-axis on the top. The relative increase is the increase improvement in the signal strength due to our focus relative to the state that was optimized with 160,000 measurements, which is, for all practical purposes, infinity. We find that with just one second of training, we get 50% of the maximum improvement. This corresponds to 4,500 measurements. Note that we need at least 3,200 measurements to actually optimize the state, because there are 3,200 antennas. And we actually get some benefit even before 3,200 measurements, because the algorithm prioritizes the most more important elements and decides them first. To get 90% of the total improvement, we need 11 seconds of training and 50,000 measurements. And in general, we need order n measurements, where n is the number of antennas. So here's our main evaluation. We have the r focus surface and the receiver, as shown here. Note that either the transmitter or the receiver has to be close to the r focus surface for it to have a significant impact. Um, we believe this is reasonable because the r focus surface, the wallpapers are cheap enough that they can be ubiquitously deployed. We place the transmitter in various different locations throughout an entire floor of our lab at Stata. 
And we find that the signal strength is consistently improved throughout the entire floor. The plot is in dB, which shows the amount of improvement in the signal. If we plot a CDF of the improvements, we find that the median improvement is 9.5 dB, the minimum improvement is 3.8 dB, and the maximum improvement is 20 dB, which is about 100x. So what are the key contributions of the paper? First, we designed an antenna surface in which we can turn some parts of the surface transparent and the other parts opaque. And second, we had a near optimal optimization algorithm that improves the signal strength by 10x. The near optimal part is under certain assumptions. The key challenge that we had to solve for this algorithm is that the quantities we need to measure, the contributions due to each of the individual elements, is about a million times smaller than the channel. And we have ended up with an algorithm that's fairly robust. And I conclude my talk, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, hi, Ish from uh, UC San Diego. It's a very interesting talk. I have a question that you assume the transmitters and receivers have a single antenna and you have the uh, array over which has multiple antennas. So what if the transmitter and receiver also have a MIMO system and how will it scale to such a system? So we believe that if you have two antennas, then it will give somewhere between, so we believe that it is complementary to this work. If the transmitter and the receiver have more antennas, then this will improve the signal strength even more. Right now, we are focused on the single antenna case because that corresponds more closely to the IR system. But that's future work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, <coughs> Mark from Amazon. <coughs> Super fun stuff. Um, uh, can you use the same, but kind of the opposite technique to steer a null from uh, noisy neighbor transmitters towards a uh, lower, a receiver looking for a lower power signal? That's a very good question, and the answer, I believe, is yes, even though we have not looked into it. That's also interesting future work. Cool. Stuff. So, Chen Feng from UCSD. Uh, so, how much resources, how much channel resources does it take to for each measurements? So, as I understand, more measurements you make, more accurate your, beam, uh, your steering will be, right. but would that also take up resources you, uh, for uh, use for communication? So the communication can happen completely in parallel with the measurements, because as I said earlier, the a random state in the wall does not change the channel very much. It changes it by less than 1%, which is well into the noise floor. So the way we imagine it working is that a <coughs> endpoint starts by transmitting, and, it, and the receiver and the controller learns how to improve the channel, and then it starts improving the channel, and the endpoint can now reduce its transmit power or get higher bit rates. So as far as communication is concerned, it can happen completely in parallel. Thank you. I have one question. Mm -hmm. So it seems the setup is for one transmitter and one receiver. So what happens if there are two different receivers? OK, so there are two ways of doing this. First, of course, you can time multiplex. And setting a state is, because it's electronics, it's pretty fast. The second is you can just, so the naive method to do is you just split the antennas into two sets and allocate one set of antennas to each. Um, the other approach is you could do slightly better. We have not explored that yet. Cool. All right, thank you. Let's thank the speaker.